Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, when a teen went missing right after, right after Christmas, people thought they had it figured out almost instantly. Two weeks before she disappeared, she had posted on Facebook about a stalker who would simply not leave her alone. So people pretty quickly put two and two together. Natalie volunteers missing. What investigators didn't know, however, was that a deeper look into her digital presence would would, would reveal she had posted on Craigslist. The post was titled, I want to put a hit on myself. Did she? Before we get into it, please click that dirty little subscribe button to see new videos every single week. Now, let's give it a go. Well, our story today takes place in Broomfield, Colorado. Picturesque place, if you will, situated right smack dab between Denver and Boulder. The population is pretty small, if you can believe that, just short of 73,000 people and 63 parks to boot. It is home to a 9-11 memorial in which a piece of the steel beam from one of the Twin Terrors is displayed. And that is the home for today's story. Not the steel beam. Natalie Bollinger and her twin sister Alicia were born on February 24th, 1998 in Westminster, Colorado. Westminster is like the next city over from Broomfield. Natalie was the daughter of Rose and Ted Bollinger. Rose was a young mother, just 19 years old when she had the twins, and the, it seems like their upbringing um, in Colorado was kind of like a little bit rough. There was uh, allegations of abuse, drugs, alcohol, all that kind of stuff. In fact, when the when uh, Natalie and her twin, Alicia, were, were quite young, Rose ha couldn't hack it anymore. She left. She went to Rhode Island, to where her own family were from. She had to just get away from Ted and everything. She wouldn't even see her kids for, for a couple of years. It was reported that Rose only went back to Colorado when she learned that Ted was in fact being, being sent to prison and then she was granted custody and she took her two young daughters back to Rhode Island with her where they grew up for a few years and, and the two twins, uh, Natalie and her sister Alicia, actually learned they had a new little brother too. They grew up in Rhode Island in this whole blended, blended family type dealio thingy bob. Natalie was described as just a kind, loving girl who loved nature and animals and believed that everyone should be treated with kindness, regardless if it was deserved. She was a creative at heart, and an artist too, as soon as her toddler hands were able to hold a crayon. She completed her high school diploma through a blended learning program called Pathways in Colorado, and she moved in with her grandparents in that state, and she went on to enroll in college to become a registered nurse. She had bright plans for the future. Now back when Natalie was just 17 years of age, she was walking down the street one day when she came across a homeless person just lying, uh, kind of sitting on the curb, and it, this homeless guy seemed like he needed help and was just being ignored by everybody. And again, you know, going back to Natalie's kind of belief that everybody, every single person, person should be treated with kindness, she went over, she took pity on him, and she just started, you know, yapping away with him, shooting the shit, struck up a conversation. They quickly became friends, and she was just in awe of, of his life story. And, and soon after, they added each other on good old Facebook. She was able to offer this guy an ear and, and a friend, be a friend to somebody who was in need, and you know, she would help him out when she could, take him out to lunch, drive him to places he needed to go, all that sort of thing. This man was Sean Schwartz. Natalie was half his age, yet this initial meeting led to an obsession for Sean. What seemingly started as a connection over mental health and just kindness quickly turned scary for Natalie. Over the course of the next two years, they would continue to talk via Facebook. Sean's comments and obsession with Natalie kind of continued to escalate and escalate, and eventually Natalie just needed to get away from Colorado. She went to Virginia, where her mom Rose was now living, because that's where she would go to her mom, you know, when things were getting tough. And Sean followed her, so he went from sweet to creep real fast. He refused to leave, even went so far as to like honking down on the horn non-stop to try and get her attention. Rose would have to come out of the house and be shaking her fist at him, telling him to, to get lost. And the cops were even called on him. And this was the pivotal event that Natalie decided to step back from the friendship and stop conversing with Sean. To Sean, this was as pleasant as a wet fart. And so he decided to take to social media to just trash Natalie and her character and kind of calling her all sorts. He was basically just ranting to himself. At some point, the harassment and stalking forced Natalie to get a restraining order against him. 
and she posted on Facebook on December 13th, 2017, warning other friends and those close to her of the situation. She was very open about threats to her family from Sean and how he would forever sleep himself if she never spoke to him again, and she wasn't planning on speaking to him again. Hey y'all, I have a public announcement. There is a man named Sean Schwartz. I met this man when I was young. I ran into him about two years ago. Long story short, I became friends with him. He sent emails for over a year close to every day, harassing me, making numerous accounts until I block him again. I'm sharing this because he's posting slander about me all over Facebook. So if you receive a message, I am sincerely sorry. Please ignore him. He's mentally ill and I'm trying to fix this. It was Christmas 2017 that Natalie and her boyfriend, Joey, would go on to share the holidays with her family without issue, no doubt hoping to put this whole Sean fiasco behind her. Unfortunately, things would only get much, much worse. On December 28, 2017, Natalie was at home uh, all morning by herself. Her boyfriend, Joey, he was up and out to work like mad early at about 6 a.m. He said he spoke to Natalie twice that day via text, once at around 9 a.m., once at about 1 p.m. He got home then to their apartment at around 3.18 p.m. and the apartment was empty and he reported her missing right then and there. Natalie was nowhere to be seen, which isn't all that concerning, but what was concerning was the fact that Natalie had left her phone. And for a young woman in this day and age, your phone is practically glued to your hand. But what really made him call the police? His own 9mm Glock handgun was missing. Hey, uh, so just a little bit ago, my girlfriend got a protection order against this man who's been stalking her for quite some time. And I came home and she's missing and all of the stuff here, I, I don't understand it. It's not like her, she's supposed to be waiting for me. man that we have the protection order against is Sean Schwartz, and he's been threatening to come hunting for her and all this stuff. He called Natalie's mom, Rose, to ask her if she had spoken to her, and she said she hadn't, but she did have a missed call from her daughter at around 2 p.m. I've been in contact with her all day until the next test I got from her was someone's at the door. Does Natalie have any mental health issues? She's great. She's been suicide a number of times. Okay, so she's sending that text message saying somebody's at the front door. Mm -hmm. You yes. haven't been able to get a hold of her since. Yeah. So when police and Natalie's family got to the apartment, fearing the worst, with the knowledge of Natalie's stalker, Sean, and just having put a restraining order in place less than a week ago, everyone figures it's an open and shut case. Sean has taken out some revenge on Natalie. All fingers. We're, we're pointing at Sean, right? Obviously. Stalker, weird obsessed stalker, yada yada yada, she tries to get rid of him. But when police picked up Sean, he is a pretty solid alibi. He was on his friend's couch all morning. Did you leave the house at all for the rest of Wednesday? No, I'm not a I'm not specific, but people scared the out of you. Okay. So then you go to sleep at the apartment that night? Wake up Thursday morning at the apartment? Okay, let's talk about Thursday. What goes on Thursday? The same thing. Never really can go anywhere. Stick at the apartment all day? I was there all day. Okay. I just wish you didn't have to waste your time on me. And we're, we're only looking to you for help. That's why we don't think you're a waste because you know her. Thank goodness. He seemed genuinely concerned for Natalie's well-being and thought he in fact thought she was still out of town for the, for the holidays. He'd also been staying away because of the restraining order. He had been obeying the, the order. The police had no reason to keep him and so he was released. Okay, the Broomfield Police Department just got a hold of me. Um, Natalie Volunteer is missing. Um, if you know her, uh, her, the phone number for the Broomfield Police Department is 303 464 um, I'm gonna post up some pictures here. Uh, please help find her, please. I, I don't, um, please help. However, all hope to find Natalie safe and alive were crushed the very next day, when at around 1.43 p.m., police discovered a body in Adams County about an hour outside of Broomsfield. Given it being just 24 hours since her disappearance, it was quickly determined that the body was indeed 
Natalie Bollinger. Coroner confirms the body found last Friday is that of 19-year-old Natalie Bollinger. Just how she died is still under investigation, but deputies want to talk to anyone who may have information on Bollinger's whereabouts after one in the afternoon on December 28th. Her body was reportedly found in the bush by a dairy farm. Autopsy revealed she was killed by a single gunshot wound to the head, and toxicity reports showed a lethal amount of heroin in her system at the time of her death. No gun was found at the scene, and Joey's gun was still missing. Before police could even announce the discovery, Natalie's father, Ted, had put a public post on Facebook that his daughter had been murdered, and it was clear who was responsible. Sean Schwartz, of course. I mean, if we're honest here, I'd be looking at Sean too. I think everybody would be. Tunnel Vision was a real clear and present thing. Immediately. As it would be. Who else would have done something to her other than the guy who was, you know, problems and is a stalker? We don't have anybody who was either talking with her through social media or through text or in person or on the telephone. Family reported the teen missing on Thursday, December 28th. The following day, a body was discovered off a rural road in Adams County. We really didn't have a whole lot of information. We were still actually even trying to come up with a name, a, a way of trying to identify who she was. A Facebook post Bollinger made just one week before her disappearance fueled a firestorm of speculation on social media. The post was a public warning about a man she said had been stalking her for years. We have talked to him um, and uh, again, not ready to call anybody a suspect. Sean, however, maintained his innocence. He may have some mental health issues, but he, but he swore he was no killer. He took to his favorite pastime, posting on social media for anyone to hear. He said over and over again he had zero involvement and the continued suspicion of him was a witch hunt. His online activity was an ongoing concern of many. However, the police had zero evidence against him to, to arrest him, so they did the next best thing. They arrested him under a mental health act, putting him on 72-hour surveillance. During this time, he resisted arrest and assaulted a police officer, which led to him getting injured. He was, however, released on January 10th, with a pending court date for his assault on the officer, but he would be cleared on all counts of any involvement in Natalie's murder. A lot about Natalie. You're going to have to have the police department send confidential information to them. Also, I've been instructed not to speak to y'all, but I got a few more fingers for you. Well, do you know what happened to her? No. You know who does? Tell me. How would I know? What happened to Natalie? What do you guys know? All I know is from Facebook Messenger, and I hate Facebook. What did Facebook Messenger say? It doesn't matter. You need to get a hold of the police and talk to them. Well, apparently you were of, of, of interest of this uh, case, so why were you of, of a suspect of interest in I this case? I was not a suspect. I was a person of interest. And I heard that. I saw it on a news report. I have not yet heard that from the police. Now, if you guys would like to, you can go contact the Broomfield Police Department and you can ask them for whatever information that you feel is pertinent. His obsession and rants continue online to this day, but police were solid in the belief he was not the killer. I'm going to start with uh, 2016. All right, so I'd known uh, who Natalie and Alicia were for, well, since they were about 13, I suppose. Um, we hung out with which led them back to square one. On January 17th, 2018, almost three weeks after Natalie's murder, the police then started going through all her uh, internet activity, social media activity, text messages, all that stuff, all the stuff she'd been doing in the days leading up uh, to her murder. They found a number of text messages going back and forth to a number she didn't have saved in her phone, all from the same day, the day she disappeared. And all those messages had been deleted. 111 of them. Enter in one Joseph Lopez. Not much could be found about Joseph. He was a 22-year-old father and a manager at the classic Italian eatery Domino's. Coworkers said he was a kind, compassionate person. He managed the doms, he munched on some za. However, coworkers said Joseph Lopez. He was thrown up at work. He was puking his guts up in the bathroom. 
on December 30th. So he really must have been eating their pizza. This was just a day after Natalie's body was found and he ended up going home early. Seemed pretty upset about the news. Now, it's not believed they knew each other or it wasn't at the time. He was just a sensitive soul. He called in sick three days after that, saying it's some kind of virus. No one though seemed to think he was acting any differently or changed other than that. So police tracked the messages between him and Natalie um, around the time of her disappearance and they went and paid him a visit on February 8th. At, they went and paid him a visit at his place of work. When the police went in there, he immediately said, I know where you're here. I, I know why you're here to see me. He willingly went to the station, the police station with, with these officers and he says, it's about that girl on Craigslist, isn't it? Why yes, yes it is. Tell us more. Yes, the girl on Craigslist, that thing. Why don't you go ahead and tell us your version of events, my man? What I'm thinking this is all about is uh, someone I was talking to over on Craigslist. I was just on there you know, looking for uh, compels. As I said, he brought up Natalie, not the police. So goes his first version of events. He started by saying he would often scroll Craigslist and happened to be in the women seeking men section and came across a post that, according to Lopez, stated, can you put a hit out on yourself? I need someone to do this for me. I'm not trying to be saved. This is not a cry for help. I've made this decision. I don't need to be talked down. I just want someone to do it for me. I'm seriously asking, this isn't the fucking game. I just need help doing it. The post made by Natalie, seemingly directly after her boyfriend left her work that morning, as the post time has been stated at 6.25 a.m. This was where the start of the text conversation between Lopez and Natalie began. What drew me to what she had posted was it was very uh, weird. Do you recall kind of what that said that got your attention? Um, well, the title itself just said, I'm thinking about putting a hit on myself. So my first thought was if you, someone obviously needs help and hasn't been getting the help that they need. Being the type of person that I am, I'm, you know, I will do anything to help someone at least stay alive, you know. My first thought was, I, I really want to help this girl. So, after a little bit, I was like, you know, I'm not getting anywhere, you know. Let's see if I can convince her to um, meet up with me and see what happens. Joseph at first says he's a good guy. He came across this post that morning and he was like, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I gotta meet this person. I gotta talk him down off a ledge. I, I went along with the role because, um, I'm a, very avid, I'm a very avid role player online. How do you go about taking the persona of a hitman? How do you take that role off? It, it really fascinates me as a writer. Yeah. I have a character that's for the horror genre. His name is Aki. He's also just a, a psycho. You know, like, he'll lure you in and that by him. Yeah. All right. She was asking me, like, um, you know, how do you want to do it? Where do you want to go and stuff? And I didn't really give her an answer. You know, I, it was just real general because, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. You know, I convinced her to, you know, meet up with me. So I went to her place and I picked her up and we went for a drive. He went and he picked her up, you know, that afternoon. He's going to take her for a drive around a beautiful Broomsfield. Show her life is worth living. But what Natalie didn't know was that Joseph Lopez had a, a, a sick and twisted mind. And he'd fantasized about killing somebody for a long ass time. And then he was licking his chops at the idea of, oh, you want me to kill you. Win-win. But that's not what Joseph said, of course. He said he picked up Natalie and they just drove around town just aimlessly. And she confided in him all of the reasons as to why she's come to the conclusion that she needs to, you know, forever sleep. According to Lopez, it was boyfriend problems, mental health, and what we know now, a traumatic childhood all played a part. Plus, she, she was known to be a drugs user. Lopez said that Natalie got frustrated with him when he was side-skirting the actual reason for their meetup, which was killing her. What did she think you were there for? She thought I was responding to the ad. In what, re in what way? Like, um, she thought I was going to be the one to do it. To take her out? We drove around for a little bit, you know, like two, three hours, I can't remember exactly, and we just talked. Cool. Eventually, I think she either got fed up with me, you know, because I guess she was pretty serious about what was going on. And, you know, she then demanded he drop her off at uh, her apartment and she said, uh, or which he said he did willingly. He thought he had saved her. And she said, you know, just drop me off here. That's um, the last time I saw her, really. 
it sucks that it turned out the way it did. But the police were no dum-dums. They had done their homework. They knew um, that Joseph Lopez had been to the place where her body was found, not near the dairy, dairy farm, tracking his phone signals. You were at the murder scene. What gives? Guy was full of shite and he'd just been found out. We're here to try to figure out what happened to her, all right? And I think that you know. There's some things I think you really want, bro. Okay? Just ask right now that you just find over there. Can you get everything off your chest, okay? When they outed him, he broke down. Now the story was yes, he had been there, but he had only watched her do it. He had begged her not to, but she ignored him and shot and killed herself anyway. She shoots herself before I can try to reach it up. She just sat down and she put it like this. Then she fired. Joseph then fled with the gun, which apparently was a payment agreement. He's like, you kill me, you get the gun. And then he also took her purse. But then what Joseph Lopez also didn't know was that the autopsy and the medical examiner could confirm that Natalie had not shot herself. They could tell she had been shot at from a distance. Somebody else had shot her. So he comes back with his third and final story. He's like, all right, guys, listen, I was joking around the previous two times. That was me just playing. You know, now I'll tell you the actual truth. When I said I was telling the truth before, I wasn't. Now I am. You can believe me this time. Okay, he did it. He pulled the trigger. He begged her to change her mind, but she insisted on being killed, execution style, on her knees. According to Lopez, he obliged her request, hands shaking, and while not even looking, he pulled the trigger. He then said he fled with the, with the person the gun, and police could confirm this much as they were found in his trunk still. He also told the police he had no idea about any drugs use and swore to the police he's, he had no idea she'd gotten high and he did not witness it. Given the stories he's told so far, who knows what, what's true though. I mean, if you're going to confess to murder, what's little drugs use? So why wouldn't he talk about that? But remember, she was found with a lethal amount of heroin in her system. Since Natalie did have a history of drugs use and, and selling, it seemed no one questioned it any further. The police also confirmed that the post he was claiming he saw, the one, the Craigslist post that Natalie posted, um, that did, in fact, exist. He wasn't bullshitting. She posted it, looking for a killer to kill her, and then deleted it within two minutes. Within two minutes, she posted it and deleted it, and in that time, Joseph Lopez saw it. He was quick enough to see it and to respond to it within two minutes at like 6.30 a.m. What was he doing browsing at that time? Like, what are the chances that an actual wannabe killer, somebody who would dreamt and, and uh, been obsessed with the idea of killing somebody, had seen it within two minutes? It's incredibly tragic and disturbing. What if Natalie had, had deleted it by the time he'd scrolled by? There's a lot of what, it, what ifs in this story. Natalie, she had a history of drugs use, of depression, and so in that two minutes, she had posted this and probably just kind of almost lashing out. The worst possible person in the world saw it and responded to it. Now an arrest and the murder of a young woman. Natalie Bollinger's case is one that we have followed very closely. Deputies in Adams County accused Joseph Lopez of shooting her in the head and then leaving her in a ditch. Joseph Lopez eventually confessed to killing Natalie, but claims it was because she asked him to through a Craigslist ad. That's what we're hearing right now, and the affidavit says Lopez told detectives he found Natalie, Natalie through a Craigslist ad titled something to the effect of, I want to put a hit on myself. The same day he was taken in for questioning, he was also arrested for the murder of Natalie Bollinger. He shortly accepted a plea deal and pled guilty to second degree in exchange for a lesser sentence and a chance for parole. In December 2018, he was officially sentenced to 48 years. It will be 2066 when his sentencing is up. Joseph Lopez will be just over 70 years of age. It was a very emotional morning here. That courtroom was full of Natalie's friends and family. Now, Natalie's father, Ted Bollinger, was able to speak in court this morning while in custody for a parole violation. Bollinger told the judge he did not agree with the plea deal offered to Lopez because a deal was not justice. He also said that neither he nor his side of the family were told about the deal at the earliest date possible. The judge denied his request to continue the hearing because the prosecution says they made several attempts to contact the Bollinger family. The Bollinger family had no say in this deal. This is no justice. I look at this deal as a deal with the devil. Natalie Marie Bollinger was a person. She had a life. Her life mattered more than you will ever know. After several emotional statements from Natalie's family, the judge gave Lopez the maximum sentence under his plea deal, 48 years in prison with five years parole.
Natalie, somebody who grew up with a lot of with a lot of trauma, and she tried to find these different ways of trying to help and heal, and in the end, she just couldn't. She just couldn't couldn't beat it, um, which makes it then just all the more tragic that like she probably po she posted it and then deleted it, asking somebody to kill her within two minutes. She obviously posted it and regretted it immediately. But a twisted killer saw it. A twisted wannabe killer, an actual killer, it turns out, because he became one. Saw it. Responded to it. They texted. They had 111 text messages between them, and eventually, they met up. And God only knows what happens. Well, what happened is that Natalie ended up dead. Still, so weird though that he of all people saw that. Makes you wonder if he had Google Alerts set up or something. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, really means a lot to me. I hope you enjoyed this old video or found it interesting uh, at the very least. Um, if you're looking for some more of that chapter, please check out the That Chapter podcast, which is available on all podcast platforms. The new episode out every single Monday, uh, and it's different stories uh, to what I tell here on the channel, so check it out if you're looking for some more. I also tell it with uh, somebody else. People won't stop texting me about Keith, who's also on the podcast, so give it a cue. But here, listen, until the next old episode, video will be up in a couple of days, so look forward to it, if you please. Uh, but you know, until then, guess what? I love ya. Mike out.